Welcome, hoş geldiniz. I'm Eylem Taşdemir, Program Manager at Columbia Global Centers Istanbul, one of the nine global centers around the world, one in Amman, Beijing, Mumbai, Nairobi, Paris, Rio, Santiago and Tunis. The Columbia Global Centers promote and facilitate the collaborative and impactful engagement of Columbia University's faculty, students and alumni with the world to enhance understanding, address global challenges and advance knowledge and its exchange. Our main objective is to connect the local with the global, to create opportunities for shared learning and to deepen the nature of global dialogue. Today, in collaboration with the International Press Institute, it's our pleasure to have distinguished experts who will share their expertise on fake news, digital echo chambers, and the impact of disinformation laws on fundamental rights and freedoms. Just one housekeeping item before we get started, as we are providing simultaneous translation during today's event, I will say a few words about that in Turkish and then continue in English. Etkinlik İngilizce dilinde gerçekleşecektir ve etkinlik süresince simultane çeviri hizmeti sağlanacaktır. Zoom ekranınızın sağ alt köşesinde bulunan interpretation ikonuna tıklayıp çeviri hizmetinden faydalanabilirsiniz. Türkçe çeviriyi dinlemek için Portekizce dilini seçmelisiniz. Sorularınızı Türkçe ya da İngilizce dillerinden birinde ekranın alt kısmında bulunan Q&A kutusu aracılığıyla bizlere ulaştırabilirsiniz. There will be simultaneous translation into Turkish. So if you would like to listen to the Turkish translation, please go to the interpretation icon at the bottom right corner of the screen and select the Portuguese option. Thank you to our translators today, Sungur Savran and Işıl Demirakın. In addition, please send your question in English or in Turkish for the panelists via the Q&A box. We have also shared this instruction in the chat box. Without further ado, I will give the floor to Emre Kızılkaya, who will moderate today's panel. Thank you. Thank you and welcome all. As digital platforms like Facebook and Google are under fire all around the world, from the United States to the European Union, and on the eve of a, of a new info, disinformation bill to be introduced in the Turkish Parliament, Columbia Global Centers in Istanbul, in partnership with the IPI, Turkey National Committee, is now organizing this online panel to shed light on fake news, digital eco chambers, and the impact of disinformation laws on fundamental rights and freedoms. Now, let me introduce you our distinguished panelists. Todd Gitlin is a professor of journalism and sociology and chair of the PhD program in communications at Columbia University and the author of 18 books, including Media Unlimited, which encompasses most of the issues that we will be talking today. Thank you, Professor Gitlin, for joining us. And Professor Filibede, Erbay Sal Filibede, is an associated professor at the Department of New Media at Bahçeşehir University, the head of the New Media Department. She received her MA degree and PhD from Galatasaray University. And she, uh, she edited the book, Information Nightmare, Fake News, Manipulation and Post-Truth Politics in the Digital Age, which I had also contributed with, with a chapter. And my name is Emre Kızılkaya. I'm a vice chair of the Vienna-based International Press Institute and the chair of IPI's National Committee in Turkey. In last year's report for the IPI, focusing on Turkey's digital media outlets, we had tried to find out which one are uh, being amplified by the algorithms and by Google and Facebook, which are actually the main sources of traffic for most Turkish independent journalism and, let's say, partisan journalism. So our main question is this, can journalism save democracy in the age of disinformation? So for, uh, for Professor Gitlin's answer, I will uh, leave the floor to him. Please, Professor. Thank you very much. I hope we uh, generate a higher proportion of useful information than Facebook does. Um, I, I think our crisis, which is genuinely deserving of the term crisis, has deep roots. Uh, and I want to speak for a moment about the great hopes that were generated in the Enlightenment 200 plus years ago about the importance of knowledge which was the catch-all term that included what today we call information. When Immanuel Kant, Kant wrote his famous essay, What is Enlightenment? 
1784. He began by saying that there was a single imperative that now <clears throat> opened up for the world, opened up a new horizon, and it was dare to know. And his premise, as well as the premise of the people that he was in communication with, and the people he was reading, he was writing this, by the way, for a newspaper, not for a philosophical journal. The premise was that everyone is capable of reason. And therefore, the more knowledge, the more information is diffused, and the more people are capable of getting access to it, the more society as a whole can approximate the turning of knowledge and information into self-government. He was concerned not simply about the spread of knowledge as such, although he was not speaking of democracy in a modern sense, he was talking about the general, let's call it informational health of the society. And so the premise was that even though the body of people to whom he was speaking in 1784 was relatively small, and was that the premise was that that number would grow. And that over time, the number of people capable of reasoning because they were in touch with information would uh, eclipse the number of people who were not capable of participating in, a, in an informed conversation. So there was a progress expectation, not perfection, but progress. And this was predicated on the assumption that information was valid information, <laughs> that information was useful, that information was, if not true, capable of being made more true by the collective discourse. Well, he could not have anticipated, I don't think anybody could have anticipated, that the flood of information would bring with it not only a larger and larger number of uh, proportion of people capable of getting access to it, but also the number of people who had a stake in spreading bad information, misinformation, disinformation. This was not, um, to those who believed in the enlightenment promise of daring to know, this was not an expectation. Their expectation was that the monarchies and other and, uh, churches and other institutions that had a stake in reducing an informed public would be overcome or would be overshadowed by the spread of information and informed people. Well, we know now that that was naive um, and those living in the late 18th century can be forgiven for their generous hopes for the future, namely that, that, uh, that, that knowledge would be a sort of self-curing, a self-perpetuating process. What, what has turned out to be true is that in the age of the internet, the cost of entering items, I don't wanna call them information because that somehow might be taken to imply that that kind of information is a public good. But in any case, people who, the cost of entering items into the global stream of, of contact is vir virtually zero. And so the spread of bits is also the spread of disinformation. It's the spread of ignorance and it's the spread of deceit. And because the cost of entry for any of us is zero, so is the cost for dictators, the cost for self-interested corporations, uh, the cost for racists and disinformation agents of many kinds. They also have the ability to uh, generate attention. And of course, attention is what we are all in the business of, of, of garnering. So we have this peculiar situation in which the more information there is, also the more disinformation there is. And the agents of disinformation can now do globally what they used to be able to do locally. So if there were um, fantastical theories, conspiracy theories, dangerous misstatements, distortions, they were no longer limited to what I can tell my neighbors 
or what I can shout from the village square or what I can post on uh, the fronts of houses, I can now spread them around the world. And so we get what I think are rightly called echo chambers in which the news, the organizations like Facebook and Google are making money by their ability to intensify people's feeling, people's direct reaction, because what they're selling is reaction. And one thing we know social psychologically is that the reactions that are most effective at generating attention uh, are the ones that excite anger, suspicion, hostility, aggression. So that's where we are. Um, and so therefore the problem we have today, we collectively, everywhere, is how to contain disinformation without undermining the ability of knowledge to spread. Uh, I know this sounds very old fashioned to many uh, to speak of knowledge. We're all supposed to be postmodern now. And we're supposed to be suspicious uh, of those who claim knowledge. And I think what we've learned to our terrible cost in the course of the pandemic is that knowledge is not to be dismissed. Knowledge is not to be uh, waved away. Knowledge is not to be uh, uh, uh, devalued simply because there are forces, political, ideological, religious, that, that dislike it. I want to say just one more word uh, on the, the question we were posed is can, what can journalism do for democracy? And my, my answer is journalism, which is committed to truth and to the process of finding truth, which is very important, just as medicine doesn't give you the final truth, but it gives you the process of ascertaining it and perfecting it. Journalism, which is in the business of ascertaining and perfecting truth is crucial to democracy, but it's not sufficient. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Why not? Why is it not sufficient? Because the institutional pressures to diminish the value of information remain. The problem of making information available is not only a communication problem, it's a political problem because there exist political institutions different in different societies that are in the business of making, taking advantage of untruth. Uh, therefore, the, the, the solutions, or at least the improvements that we hope to make require that our institutions be reformed in such a way as to give the advantage to truth tellers. Uh, this cannot be done. I mean, obviously education is an important role to play, but our political process also has an immense role to play. We've discovered to our great shame in the United States in recent years, that when disinformation joins with political power, then we get a, a wholly unscrupulous and dangerous uh, brew, a dangerous combination uh, and it's that combination of disinformation and power that has to be addressed. In our different nations, we'll have, we'll find, we'll seek different ways of trying to address that combination. But it's that combination we have to address. Thank you, Professor Yukin. And uh, now with the same question, let's turn to Professor Arbas al -Filibere. And the question is, uh, can journalism uh, save us from this uh, anti-democratic tendencies and all the disinformation, uh, especially this information war. There are, th this is this war happening between different states, between different uh, groups of people. What do you think? Um, at first, we need to talk about maybe back to technology because as you know, with two technologies gave us some promises. Uh, with, with, with two technologies, everybody uh, uh, at this time could uh, be able to uh, access to the platforms that we use and they what it has to be actually this it was important uh, we we everybody 
should declare their opinion freely. Okay, it was it was the idea, and what what does that mean? Web two technologies would uh, create as a public sphere. We, we we are talking about a digital public sphere here, but uh, the function of Web two, uh, right now Web two is not function like this, as you know, because by, when we say Web two technologies, what we are talking about, we are talking about digital platforms, social media platforms, and they are, as you know, based upon uh, profit. So here, uh, right now, we are talking about digital capitalism. So uh, can we say, uh, especially in uh, the countries, uh, which actually under an authoritarian regime, can we say that uh, we are freely, uh, we are really free to share our ideas uh, on social platforms? So here, as Emma said, we will discuss the, namely the social media law. We say social media law here in Turkey. So we will discuss it, and not here in Turkey, but also in many other countries uh, with the effect of pandemic, with the disinformation spread of the dis disinformation, fast flow of information. And here as uh, Professor Gutman said, not only true information, but also disinformation spread very fast. And here uh, we see that uh, this, the government start to use uh, the spread of disinformation and try to control platforms at the end. So how we will be free? How journalists, especially, for example, here in Turkey, we have alternative media uh, outlets, and mostly they try to uh, cover stories uh, in, with a different perspective, actually. And uh, how they will, they will do their job, we, we discuss it right now. Um, in the book that uh, Emre mentioned, the Information Nightmare, um, I, I have a chapter there and I did a research and I uh, think about at this time uh, about the rise of fact checking initiatives because all around the world we see rise of fact checking initiatives. At this time, I uh, check 222 fact checking initiatives all around the world. And right now, uh, I check uh, a little bit earlier uh, from the Duke University's reporters labs, uh, all around the world, uh, 349 fact checking in initiatives uh, working. So uh think about it only almost one and a half year uh tries almost i don't know one about 100 uh number actually of fact checking initiative funded so on the other hand what we saw i compared this fact checking the number of fact checking initiatives and how they function uh with the rank of countries i i checked the countries and i uh, check uh, the rank of countries according to the uh, World Democracy Index uh, of Economics and uh, Media Freedom Index. And if a country is not free, uh, there is no fact-checking initiatives. Uh, if uh, a country is not uh, defined uh, full democratic, full democratic, or part democratic or uh, maybe hybrid, uh, there is no uh, fact checking. Uh, yes, there are fact checking initiatives, but if it's under an authoritarian regime, there is no fact checking initiatives. Here we need to think about maybe uh, freedom of the press. Uh, yes, journalism should save democracy because uh, it's committed to, again, uh, to the truth. Uh, it's about uh, at the end, uh, the pub, it's a, at the end, access to information is a public right, isn't it? So uh, we need to access the true information. But we know that uh, with uh, the data that we gave about ourselves, every day we are giving uh, some kind of information to those platforms with, uh, by sharing, willingly sharing our 
uh, data with those platforms, what we are doing, we are stuck in some kind of filter bubbles. And we start to see same kind of information. At this point, we cannot talk about media pluralism. We cannot talk about diversity. We always see if, for example, if we are in a channel and we are always seeing uh, same kind of information. And if it's this information, what we will do, how we will get out. We need to think about, of course, media literacy. But at this point, a few ignore to learn uh, or get some digital media literacy skills, how uh, you will understand which information is true and which one is false. During the pandemic, we saw it, by the way, it uh, affected public health in a bad way. And still uh, we see and hear several stories uh, about how this information affect our lives. Uh, this is it for now. And yes, I, I think journalism should say us, but how, I don't know. And in which democracy, what actually, when we talk about democracy, what democracy, which democracy we are talking about is important because uh, if we are talking about USA, in USA, there are many fact-checking initiatives. Yes, journalists can do their job maybe, but, in some part of the world, it's not working like this, unfortunately. Thank you. Um, I would like to tell you about one of the founders of the IPI in 1950, when IPI was founded at Columbia University. One of the founders was doc Dr. Ahmet Emin Yalman. Dr. Yalman was a very well-known Turkish journalist back then. And interestingly, in 1914, he had uh, published a PhD thesis from Columbia University entitled The Development of Modern Turkey as Measured by Its Press. It's kind of a content analysis, discourse analysis, uh, you know, counting all the uh, news articles from all around the Ottoman Empire at that time. Uh, and it was right after the Turkish press was free again because between 1876 and 1908, uh, the year 1908, there was a tyrannical rule of an absolute monarch in Turkey, Abdul Hamid II, the Ottoman Sultan. And then the a Republican Revolution happened. They couldn't yet declare the Republic at that time, but it was obviously a constitutional list uh, revolution. And there was a boom of news content at that time. And the, the, for instance, adoption of the Western kind of style headlines. Before that time in Turkish press, you couldn't see headlines. The, the concept was at that time very new. So the Westernization of the Turkish press started. And Dr. Yalman's thesis at the Columbia University revealed a lot of data about that process. But he also warned that the uh, an abundance of content uh, does not necessarily mean that it will be good for the public. Although at that time, suddenly there were a lot of news stories, uh, it doesn't mean that the, they are were like quality journalism. They were still like, uh, you know, a little bit shallow, a little bit yellow kind of uh, journalism. So it brings us perhaps to the media torrent concept that Professor Giplin discusses because uh, they, for instance, these emotional experiences, it's it, just triggering emotional experiences through a content is not something new. All the tabloid press in the world, they were always doing that, right? So, But right now, corporate media outlets are, as uh, Professor Gitton observed, are too willing to offer uh, an endless supply of such a media content, evoking emotions, triggering us to like a content or making us angry so that we will comment more so that they will earn more from the public's emotions. Uh, how would you like to elaborate on the media uh, torrent concept, Professor Gittinant? Do you think that, for instance, concretely, do you think that the um, press in the, in the United States right now, for instance, the New York Times, right? It's a successful uh, media company uh, based on subscription model right now, very different than what it was 50 years ago, which was completely advertising based. And advertising money is going to companies like Facebook and Google, but subscriber uh, revenue is higher and higher on, on the New York Times. And I think it's a big success. But 
for instance, what would you like to tell about the local journalism? How do you observe it in, in the United States? Your story is very interesting and very relevant. What has happened in the United States is that local journalism is a disaster area. Um, it increasingly, the small papers are unable to support themselves commercially because they're competing with organizations like Google and Facebook who are basically thieves. <laughs> they're, they're, lifting, they're lifting news from established news organizations like the New York Times and, and, and, and putting it out there free. Uh, moreover, we already were experiencing a kind of pressure toward oligopoly because as news organizations began to suffer the loss of advertising, they also suffered uh, a loss of commercial viability. And so many people, many good journalists have been driven out of the business, even before the internet be, uh, reached the proportions it has today reached. So now this was all permitted to happen because of a fantasy that was, uh, alas, the governing fantasy in the United States and in many other countries, namely that the, that the, that the diffusion of information is like a marketplace. The more goods, the better. The, the, the, the, the, the buyers are assumed to be sovereign. Consumer sovereignty was the, the banner. However, we know that this is, uh, this is a fantasy, that the loud noises uh, have the capacity to drown out the quieter voices. The more hysterical voices have a tendency to crowd out uh, the more reasoned voices. And this is especially true at a time when the world is very confusing. The world is very tangled and the kinds of conference, the kinds of troubles that people confront, whether it's climate change or pandemics or autocracy, these are these were unprecedented in their in their scale, in their scope. So what I think, you know, the moral here is that the market, uh, which was believed for many years to be, you know, the the solution, is in part the problem. And so I would, I would recast, because the media torrent is so engulfing, I would say that our problem is twofold. Number one is what can journalism do for democracy? But the other is what can democracy do for journalism? Because what we've learned is that the commercial model uh, is, not, uh, is not adequate to, to, at, at all. Uh, the commercial model values garbage as much as it values truth. Uh, again, different countries with different traditions will have to face this differently. But I, I know that in the United States, many journalists feel that as soon as the government is brought in as a, as a potential assistant to the journalistic process, they get very nervous because all they can see when they see government is censorship. And I, they have good reasons to be fearful. Uh, but we also have good reasons to fear the absence of regulation. And we have been through a period of deregulation for going on decades now, which has thrown us into this sewer of disinformation. Uh, it's an urgent political problem to address it. Thank you, Professor. And there was a, a, one of my favorite TV shows, uh, The Newsroom, perhaps you saw it. The lead character named Will McAvoy, uh, played by Jeff Bridges, had once said in one, one episode that uh, it might come as a surprise to you that some of history's greatest American journalists are working right now, exceptional minds with years of experience and, and an unshakable devotion to reporting the news. But these voices are a small minority now and they do not stand a chance against the circus when the circus comes to town. They are overmatched, he says. So it's like this torrent of news and you are, uh, as a content produ producer, I mean, all journalists are become something like a content producer and that content can be anything like a cat video or something like that too. So, um, and the societies should build some new mechanisms to support journalism, as Professor Gibbon said. Uh, but what are the structures that societies should build 
other than, for instance, uh, Professor Elbaysal had mentioned uh, fact-checking organizations, but other than that, for instance, do you believe, Professor Elbaysal, that uh, pu for public interest journalism, non-profit journalism is the only way or the publicly funded journalism is the only way? And if the publicly funded journalism is the only way in a country like Turkey, where the government, where the state is part of the problem, uh, what should happen? Okay, problem here in Turkey, for example, the main problem is this. Uh, state should, uh, Professor Goodwin asked a very good question. What can democracy do for journalism? So uh, state should support uh, media outlets, isn't it? Uh, in a well-functioned democracy, it has to be like this. And uh, plur media pluralism here is very important, but on the other hand, what we see uh, about state advertisements here in Turkey, for example, they don't share ads accurately, or they don't support uh, alternative media outlets. So what is happening here in Turkey? What we see, uh, mostly media outlets or journals try to uh, find some funds or try to uh, do, in a way, crowds by through crowdsourcing, uh, they try to create their own media and, or they do clickbait journalism. <laughs> this is uh, also important. Yes, they define themselves as alternative media outlet, but they do clickbait journalism sometimes because they need to earn money. Uh, and at the end, it turns out uh, clickbait is a good thing maybe for them. And uh, here, uh, what we see, uh, journalism actually has a huge problem, face with a huge problem here, because uh, as I said, for example, as Emma said, uh, when I ask my students what you will do when you uh, be graduated, and they don't say I will be journalist, I, I will be content producer, because right now everybody as content producer here in Turkey uh, to freely declare what they are thinking, uh, they produce content. And uh, because mainstream media is unfortunately uh, here, mainstream media are unfunctional and uh, they don't want to work for uh, mainstream media outlets or for also for local uh, media, they don't want to work for uh, this uh, media organizations. And uh, also here, yes, I talk about fact checking initiatives because uh, mostly uh, here, when we actually read news, we see it. Uh, when we listen, when we watch, we see it. Uh, they don't fact check. If something is viral, it's uh, is publishable or uh, they need to share it uh, because it's at the end uh, it's an opportunity for them to earn money so they don't want to miss this opportunity this is it so here how uh, democracy will save journalism at first journalism should save democracy uh, maybe or uh, these content producers should save should help actually uh, to public to save the democracy and then because we should inform them at the end they should inform them and then uh, democracy should save maybe uh, journalism I don't know this is the situation here in Turkey thank you uh, Harvard professor Michael Sandel was uh, is one of the leading for leading voices that I heard uh, who keep warning the humanity that uh, market economy as a mechanism to efficiently and effectively distribute resources can be all right. But when it turns into a market society in which everything can be sold and bought, even the most sacred values of humanity, humanity is like that, then there is a problem, he says. So it's like, I think the news content is kind of uh, in a similar uh, dilemma now because as the New York Times is racing on the same level playing field of commercialism. Uh, and by the way, it's also like all these um, Google, Facebook, they're also 
exporting these mechanisms to other countries as well. I would like to hear what Professor Gitlin thinks about what uh, some call the California ideology, where Silicon Valley is, uh, and they are, uh, you know, exporting this to the world. How the American values of market society affects the world? Well, I think Professor Sandel is exactly right, and the the problem is that content is is a neutral term any you know any a lie is content uh, a distortion is content a uh, an ins in incitement to riot is content um, and the 18th century idea that people can be trusted to elevate the level of conversation to elevate the level of discourse to elevate the level of democratic deliberation is a fantasy um, it is necessary to impose democratic controls that will differ according to national traditions, but in any case must be interventions in a process that cannot be permitted to go on unbridled. So I think the notion of providing democratic support for journalism is extremely important that journalism is too important to be left to the profit motive alone. Uh, and I think that whether we're talking about nonprofit organizations, which are being experimented with, whether we're talking about educational institutions that should be, I think, more deeply involved in uh, conveying news, um, whether we're talking about the, the role of, uh, of, of public services of different kinds, there are many ways to do this, but the goal is to provide a, a buttress, a support for, uh, for a journalism that has a responsibility to the public good, not simply to the private aggrandizement of commercial institutions. Thank you. Uh, by the way, I would like to note that in Media Unlimited, Professor Gitten says that in a society uh, that fancies itself the, the freest ever, spending time with communications machinery is the main use to which we have put our freedom, which also emphasizes the importance of hardware, the devices that we use, uh, not only the software like algorithms, but the producers of this hard hardware as the owners of the infrastructure and the inventors. They are also really powerful now. The power holders are them. And one of them was Steve Jobs, actually, who like invented the iPhone and iPad. And in Steve Jobs' um, authorized biography by Walter Isaacson, the, the famous one, in one part, he says that the best vacation I have ever been on was uh, we went down to the coast of Italy, then to Athens, and then to Turkey, Ephesus. Where, where they have these ancient public laboratories, uh, an interesting ancient place, but then they went to Istanbul and Steve Jobs hired a history professor to give his family a tour, he explains there. And at the end, they went to a Turkish bath and there they were uh, drinking coffee and the professor was lecturing Jobs uh, about the youth, etc. cetera. Uh, he says, Steve Jobs says that I had a real revelation. Revelation. We were all in robes and they made some Turkish coffee for us. The professor explained how the coffee was made, very different from anywhere else. And I realized, Steve Jobs says, so effort what? Which kids, even in Turkey, give a S word about Turkish coffee? All day I had looked at young people in Istanbul. They were all drinking what every other kid in the world drinks. And they were wearing clothes that they look like they bought at the Gap. Uh, and they, they are all using cell phones. They were like kids everywhere else. It hits me that for young people, this whole world is the same now. When we are making products, there is no such thing as a Turkish phone or a music player that young people in Turkey would want that's different from one young people everywhere uh, elsewhere would want. We are just one world now, he says. It's completely, I think, ideologically driven uh, stuff here, but uh, it uh, reflects the Californian ideology as well, because the right now, I think, uh, like more than 30% uh, of the global market of uh, cell phones are held by Apple. It's one of the, it's the most uh, valuable company in the world. 
so on one side, there is also Apple. I will just mention that. But as Steve Jobs there is talking about young people too, and the democracies and journalism's future is also tied to what's, how young people uh, will develop themselves. And as Professor Erbaisal, you are working closely with communication students. And we, by the way, have some questions already uh, come from the question and answer section. And anyone can ask, please. There are already some questions. And some communication um, and journalism students are also in the audience now. Uh, what do you think that, and you are, by the way, Professor Erbaisal, you also have a lot of uh, students from different countries. In, from Asia, from Africa, from Europe, you have, uh, you see their how their cultures, etc., uh, affect all these content consumption and production. Uh, are you um, more optimistic about the future when you are looking uh, into these uh, young uh, colleagues, uh, whether they can create a new system that will save journalism through us, uh, through democracy, or save democracy through journalism, and vice versa. Uh, if I here, I can only talk about my students. Yes, I how many students are coming from mostly from uh, Middle Eastern countries, by the way, and Africa. Uh, sometimes Europe, uh, Erasmus exchange students are coming, uh, and yes, we have Turkish students, of course. Uh, uh, I, I have a chance uh, to compare. Uh, they are at the top, they use uh, digital platforms, which platforms they are using. And what I know, for example, yes, here in Turkey, mostly Turkish uh, students, young people are using Instagram, but uh, in, middle, in the Middle East, Facebook is still very popular. Uh, Facebook here in Turkey, for example, only popular uh, for the people who are uh, above their 50s, maybe. And uh, but uh, here at first I, I, I wanted to talk about their, uh, how they use social uh, media platforms uh, and what they do. Uh, you ask my students, you may remember it, um, you ask my students, uh, are you daily reading news? Are you consuming news? What, which uh, platforms you are following, etc., etc. Uh, what they say, they say, I follow Instagram. No, you cannot uh, follow Instagram to uh, learn what is happening around you. So uh, here, Yes, they have a great potential, by the way, because they are uh, searching for everything instantly. And when you say something, uh, they want to learn it. And but on the other hand, they uh, what they do, like maybe everybody else, they consume only what algorithms uh, serve them. Okay, this is it, and. Uh, we know that I, what algorithms serve us, uh, they serve us uh, what we consume. Here, they need to, again, develop themselves. But on the other hand, uh, about the production part, uh, they, they do. Actually, I, we ask them to produce uh, new stories, uh, and they do. They, they, they do great job, by the way, uh, and they have a critical approach. Uh, they follow uh, global issues, problems, etc. but not all of them, of course. It's changing from country to country, from student to student. Uh, they have a great potential, uh, I, I should say this. Uh, but again, uh, we are missing something here. Uh, before, in, I don't know, 19s, maybe you, you will remember uh, this as well. Uh, media organizations were like a school, you know. And right now, uh, for most of them, it is hard to find a school uh, to practice what they learn. This is a problem. Unfortunately. Thank you. So the first question from the audience, um, Professor Gitlin, would you like to answer Zeyne Shah Shahin's question? 
She sure. asks, how can we contain this information without ruining democracy? Because sometimes governments claim they ban certain applications, websites, for the sake of stopping this information, they claim, but in reality, they ban them for their own political agenda. Well, governments are, are social contrivances and they have their own interests. So the, we have to ensure that there, that within the institutions of government, there are ways to um, prevent the usurpation of information. Uh, the, you, governments are not neutral, but they could not be uh, so, and they, and they should not be permitted a free hand. But they should also be required uh, to be responsible to uh, for criticism. Uh, they should not be in the business of jur of jailing journalists. They should be interest. They should be in the interest of uh, generating discussion and generating uh, more truth rather than less. So yes, there's, there, there is no easy fix here. <laughs> Journal, uh, uh, uh, uh, government is not, you know, the, um, is not uh, the medical solution, but, but democracy, if it's properly engaged in the process of elevating truth, uh, can help. Thank you. And uh, a, a communication student from India, uh, she didn't write, write her name here, but uh, a freelance journalist also, she's asking, uh, I noticed the poster said disinformation, is there a dis difference between disinformation and misinformation, are they synonymous? And distorted news is not a recent phenomenon, are checks and balances needed more now because information spreads more quickly now? What would you like to say, Dr. Erweiser? I would say disinformation is deliberate distortion, is deliberate lies. Uh, misinformation is something that is a normal consequence of human error. Misinformation comes out of mistakes. Uh, and the, the good thing about journalism when it's a functioning system is that it has the mechanism for correcting mistakes, just as medicine is not perfect, but it leads to improvements. So, uh, you know, the, the disinformation, uh, the, the, the deliberate spread of falsehood, I think is, is a criminal activity and needs to be judged accordingly and prevented accordingly. There need to be, there need to be consequences for the organizations that promote it. Checks and balances are absolutely more necessary today because of the speed with which lies can travel around the world. But I wanna add one other thing. It, this is not a completely bleak picture because it's also true that more and more people around the world are attuned to the need for good information. If we think, for example, about their, the, the global attention to the climate, which has been manifest in Glasgow in the last couple of weeks, we can see that people can use the means of communication in order to empower themselves, in order to make sound judgments. It is, the, it is not the people's ignorance that is preventing the world from coming to grips with climate change. It is the greed and, and, and, and, and dishonesty of, of, of the corporations and the governments that they control, which is the problem. Thank you, Dr. Arvasal. Do you want to add something? That, by the way, uh, the Indian students, this uh, communication student from India, her name is Shiri Ghosh. Uh, as uh, Professor Gutman said, this information uh, is something uh, produced consciously at first, uh, because uh, it's, well, on the other hand, it's a, a form of propaganda at the end, or uh, right now we are talking about manipulation uh, mostly, and it's about manipulation and uh, what you aim by producing, actually by using this, by disinforming people, what you aim? This is the main question. You aim in a way, affect people. Uh, you try to manipulate them. Uh, and uh, sometimes by using this information, there are some 
people who use digital platforms and try to, uh, in a way, uh, earn money. And uh, this is it. And on the other hand, about misinformation, uh, here we may actually misinform people. Sometimes in our daily life, we are all, in a way, using web two technologies, isn't it? And uh, just by liking something, we inform people. So we may misinform people. Uh, but here, the most important thing, uh, maybe about disinformation and misinformation, uh, yes, uh, the actually accessing true information is really important. But how we will access true information? This is uh, the main problem. We need to understand. We need to uh, teach people we need to tell people everybody right now yes it's impossible maybe to tell our parents uh, to teach them because they are not our students our students but uh, please uh, when you leave this webinar go and tell your parents what is misinformation what is disinformation how they access free information etc etc this is really important because yes I talk about fact checking initiatives but they cannot fact check everything uh, and uh, many people uh, don't uh, read what they uh, did, what they uh, is true or not, et cetera, et cetera. They are writing about uh, viral uh, news stories. News story is not true here. Fake news is not true term, by the way. Yes, uh, the content that they fact checked. And uh, what we have to do, we have to teach everybody uh, what kind of digital threats we are facing right now. This is important, maybe. And th those are the yes digital threats uh, we are facing, by the way. And on the other hand, about I, I want to add something. Uh, in all around the world, they are talking about Yes, regu yes, regulate uh, disinformation. Uh, and yes, we are talking about social media law, but how we will do this? Because as you know, in Germany, they, they try to uh, develop a law and uh, they talk about what is hate speech such a long time. Uh, in many countries, they are in a rush uh, uh, to develop a social media law, to regulate those uh, digital platforms. Uh, and it's almost impossible to regulate everything uh, on the web, okay? It's, it's almost impossible. Uh, and how and who will regulate it? This is also important because when they regulate it, they may write, if we talk about authoritarian regimes, they may hide uh, some part of the truth, isn't it? So hiding some part of, part of the truth might be defined as, as misinformation, but if you are conscious of doing this, it's disinformation, isn't it? So how they regulate it is also really important at, at this point, by the way. I want to add this. Thank you. And the last question to Professor Gitlin, and then we can conclude. Uh, Henry Chan is asking, do you think the Western media is being compromised for its independence and controlled by the big corporation? Uh, yes and no. Yes, the big corporations have their stakes, but the problem of disinf and they have their uh, they take advantage of privileged positions. But the problem we face in, in disinformation goes far beyond uh, the the big corporations. Part of what we're facing, because of the low cost of entry, is that uh, small entities, little groups, sometimes with state sponsorship sometimes with commercial sponsorship, most often with the sponsorship of political ideologues, have seized, the, the, uh, have claimed the position of, of, of the claim to freedom. They claim to be the alternative to the big corporations, but the lie is not the uh, only alternative to, and it's not even the soundest alternative to uh, the regime of, of, of blandness and, and, and, and slant bias. Uh, the, the most dangerous biases we see today are on the part of people who have no professional standing, who have no interest in truth, who have only an interest in stoking up political rage 
xenophobia, hatred. Uh, they also have to be attended to. And um, so we have, <laughs> we have, a, we have a, a boatload of problems, big corporations, small um, uh, uh, apparatuses of insult and, and hatred. Um, we have a big, we have a big, <laughs> we have a lot of business to do. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Giplin, Dr. Erbaisal, and all participants for joining us at this webinar of Columbia Global Centers Istanbul in partnership with the IPI National Committee in Turkey. Hope to see you in another webinar in the future. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you so much. Bye bye.